Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Wesley Whitaker, and I'm one of your Ath Fellows this year. Almost 10 years ago, I vividly remember sitting in front of the TV glued to CNN as Anderson Cooper described how the country was quickly sliding into the biggest recession since the Great Depression. I may not have known anything about supply and demand, credit markets, or what the heck derivatives were, but it was obvious even then that this event would profoundly shape the, the coming years. According to some metrics, the economy started to turn around after the first year of the Obama presidency, and his administration saw the longest sustained period of job creation and GDP growth of any modern president. Despite this data, as well as a soaring stock market, many people in this country have felt that the recovery extolled by pundits and politicians never actually came. No candidate capitalized on this sentiment better than Donald Trump, who made the economy the centerpiece of his campaign. Our guest tonight will describe the origins of the economic trends that helped fuel this sentiment, as well as discuss how they can be changed in the coming years. N. Gregory Mankiw is the Robert M. Barron Professor of Economics at Harvard University. As a student, he studied economics at Princeton University, where he received his bachelor's, and MIT, where he got his PhD. As a teacher, he has taught macroeconomics, microeconomics, statistics, and pr principles of economics. He even spent one summer working as a sailing instructor on Long Beach Island. <coughs> Professor Mankiw is a prolific writer and a regular participant in academic and policy debates. His re research includes work on price adjustment, consumer behavior, financial markets, monetary and fiscal policy, and economic growth. His published articles have appeared in academic journals such as the American Economic Review and the Journal of Political Economy, as well as in more widely accessible forums including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. He has written two popular textbooks that I think some of you are aware of, <laughs> the Intermediate Level Macroeconomics and the Introductory Textbook Principles of Economics. The latter has sold over two million copies and has been translated into 20 languages. In addition to his teaching, research, and writing, Professor Mankiw has been an advisor to the C Congressional Budget Office, as well as the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and New York. He also serves as a research associate at, of the National Bureau of Economic Research and served as chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors from 2003 to 2005. Professor Mankiw's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Financial Economics Institute at Claremont McKenna College. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited Please silence and put away your mobile devices at this time. And please join me in welcoming Professor Mankiw to the Athenaeum. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's really a great honor to be here. Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting things to talk about today, uh, but I want to talk, start with this picture here. Um, uh, and I'm not interested in the person. I'm interested in the hat. Uh, make America great again. Uh, this. This obviously resonated, this catchphrase resonated with lots of people uh, in the last election. And what I want to do is, today is to talk about the economic dimensions of this. Uh, what is it about the economy that made people feel like America wasn't great? What made people feel unsatisfied that they decided to elect what obviously has been a very a dis an outsider, a disruptor, to really to shake things up? So, so what, um, there's really three parts of my talk today. Um, the th three parts are basically facts hypotheses, and policies. So I'm going to talk about what are the facts, what are the trend, underlying trends that might make people feel uneasy about what's going on in the US economy. I then want to give you my best guess as to what are the economic forces driving uh, these, these trends. And then once we have some hypotheses in hand, we can then talk about what policies might be pursue to reverse, reverse some of these trends. So that's, that's, that's my agenda today. So Part one is, what are the facts? Well, this chart shows you the growth rate of real GDP. I've averaged this over a 20-year period. So the, the first observation here is growth from 1947 to 1967, all the way to the most recent observation, which is 19, growth from 1997 to 2017. So this is growth in, in real GDP per person. GDP is, of course, total income of the economy. Real means adjusted for inflation. This is basically average income of the economy, more or less, the broadest measure of average income. And what you see here is you see that this recent observation is the slowest growth experienced during this period. We've been living through a very slow period. A part of this is the financial crisis and the recession, but it's not just that. This is a 20-year average. So we're trying to average out over the business cycle. And, and this shows you that we, we've been living really through a very poor time. So not only was the re recession in 2008 very deep, it was followed by a quite a slow recovery. And so as a result, this, the 20-year average 
is, over this, is really quite uh, disappointing. Um, here's another way to look at that, this. This is showing you the growth in, 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 in family incomes um, for different parts of the income distribution. So this, this over here is the bottom fifth of the income distribution. This is the middle class, the middle fifth. This is the top fifth, and this is the top 5%, which is, of course, a subset of the top fifth. The blue bars show growth before 1973. And here you see sort of robust growth in all parts of the income distribution. So both rich people and poor people were experiencing rapid growth in incomes. And indeed, growth seemed a little bit higher for people at the bottom of the income distribution. So we were becoming more equal as a society. But and then after 1973, things changed. That's, that's the, the, uh, these brown bars here. We see after 1973, growth at the top was still OK, but a little lower than, than before. But growth at the bottom completely fell out. So people at the bottom of the income distribution were experiencing um, basically no growth in, growth in family incomes over a very, very long period of time. So we, we've gone for a period of, to a period of lower growth and widening inequality, because people at the top were growing faster than people at the bottom. So that's the, those are the two facts that I want to focus on, um, slower growth and widening uh, inequality. Now when you think about inequality, people are particularly interested in the two tails of the distribution, the very rich and the very poor. So here are here's some data on the 1%, the uh, which got a lot of attention during the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, this shows you the percentage of total income going to the top 1% uh, based on income tax data. And we see is that from, from 1913, when the income tax began, to the 1970s, the share going to the top 1% uh, fell from about 20% of total income to about 10% of total income. That's basically going from the Great Gatsby era right, to basically when I was in college. And then from the 1970s to today, th that trend reversed itself. And the share of total income going to the top 1% approximately doubled. Went from about 10% of total income to about 20% of total income. Remember that number, approximately doubled, because that's going to be important later when we think about possible solutions to this. So this is the, the share going to the uh, top, um, top, top 1%. Now, this next chart shows you an even more rarefied group. This is the 1% of the 1%. To be in the top 1%, you need family income of about $450,000. To be in the top 0.01%, you need family income of about $11 million a year. So, you know, a, um, a, a couple, a married couple, a couple of successful physicians is probably in the 1%, but probably not in the, in the 0.01%. This is basically Elon Musk and Taylor Swift. <laughs> okay. Um, and what do you see here? Again, the same U shaped pattern where inequality fe uh, fell and then, then rose again, but the but the changes are much more pronounced. Remember the previous chart, we saw the share going to the 1% roughly doubled from the 1970s. Here the share going to the top 0.01% uh, increased by roughly a factor of five. So a very, very big change in the share going to the very top sliver of the uh, income distribution. So this tells you what's going on at the top. Here's, here's a chart that shows you what's going on at the bottom. This is the, po the, the official poverty rate. Starts in 1959. And you see that from 1959 to sometime in the 1970s, there's a pretty persistent decline in, in poverty. This is when, during, the, it was during this period, was when, when uh, John Kennedy could say a rising tide raises all ships. And then in the 1970s, because of rising inequality and basically very little low growth and low incomes, we see that there was essentially no trend in the poverty rate. You see somewhat. Some fluctuations, the poverty rate tends to go up in recessions, which are these shaded bars here, and then down during booms. But the long-term trend since the 1970s has been flat. Basically, no, no significant advances in poverty since sometime in the mid-1970s. And here's a picture that from Raj Chetty. We've all heard about the American dream, and of course, that means different things to different people. But one, one, one way of manifesting the American dream is, what's the chance that a, a person is going to do better in terms of income than their parents? And so Chetty actually has gotten data of linking, linking, parent, linking uh, children and parents. Children, of course, once they're adults and they're earning an income. And, and figured out the probability of doing better than your parents as a function of age of birth. 
If you were born in 1940, the probability that you're going to earn higher income than your parents is, is about 90%. You'll almost certainly do better than your parents. If you're born in the 1980s, the chances of you doing better than your parents is only about 50-50. So quite a big decline in this metric for the American dream. This is not a new fact. This is a really another way of stating the two facts I've showed you, which is we live in a period of slower growth, so the average person is not advancing as fast, and widening inequality to the extent that there's growth in income, it's all showing, a lot of it is showing up at the top. And Chetty has done um, some calculations to attribute this decline in the American dream, and he finds about a third of it is attributable to the lower growth, and about two-thirds of it is attributable to the, to the rising inequality. So both, both of these facts are important and are manifesting themselves in, in this particular phenomenon here, which is a particularly dramatic way of explaining uh, lower growth uh, and, 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 and rising inequality. OK, so those are the facts. Those are the facts. And those are the facts I want to explain. And you can sort of see why a typical voter surely was not studying the data like an economist would. But if you're living in a period where it's becoming less and less likely that your children are being born and going to do better than you, that, that kind of makes you kind of feel bad about the economy. You know, you, you want somebody to come and make America great again. But before we talk about how we might do that, let's talk about what are the economic forces are explaining these facts. I'm, I'm going to give you my best guesses as to what is driving these two forces. The one thing driving slower growth is changes in labor force participation. So labor force participation is essentially the percentage of adults who are working or looking for work. So these are people who are in the labor force, the percentage of adults who are looking for work. And you can see that this is far from steady. It went from like 59% in 1960 up to 67%, and then it's fallen back down to here to about 63%. So you see these, these long-term trends. And when there are more people working, there are more people producing, and that income is going to be rising. And there's fewer people working, there's fewer people producing, and that's going to tend to be a downward force on income. So what, what's driving, driving these long-term trends? I think we have a pretty good handle on the main, main driving forces here. What's driving labor force participation up during this period here? Well, this was largely the women's movement. Women are entering the labor force. Right? Women's role in society is very different than it was say, when, when, when I was born, back here at the beginning of this chart. And as women enter the labor force, labor force participation goes up. They start earning incomes that, that help the GDP expand. Of course. This phenomenon can't go on forever, because women can enter the labor force, but once they're in the labor force, they can't enter again. They can only do it once, and so therefore this force plateaus off at some point. And then what happens over here, this is the baby boomers starting to retire. The baby boomers um, started being born in the, in the late 40s, and around now they're starting to retire. I, I just turned 60 a week or two ago. I'm, sorry, I'm right in the middle of the baby boom, born in 1958. Uh, and I, and I, I'm not quite retired yet, but just wait a few years, and I'll be. I'll, and, and so more of us will be retiring. And this, and this, this downward trend for labor force participation is is probably going to continue. And it provides a downward, it put downward force on on, in, on incomes because there are fewer fewer people working and, enter, and earning incomes. So I think that these demographic forces are, the, are sort of the, one of the things driving the trend toward lower income growth that we've seen. Another thing driving it is productivity. There was a book that came out uh, about a couple of years ago by Robert Gordon uh, called The Rise and Fall of American Growth. And Gordon's hypothesis is pretty simple. He's saying, we basically live in an era which technological change is just not all that impressive. Now, to some people that seems kind of surprising. After all, think of all the stuff that you have that your parents didn't have, right? You have a, you've got a smartphone and you have a Twitter account and we have Google, and it seems like, wow, we live in an era of tremendous technological change. But Gordon points out that, that yes, these are impressive technological changes that are contributing to growth, but what, what, what did previous generations have? They invented stuff like electrification, the internal combustion engine, in, indoor plumbing. Right, if I had to ask you, which should you give up first, your Twitter account or indoor plumbing? <laughs> you probably, you probably, wouldn't choose um, your, 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 your indoor plumbing. You probably want to keep indoor plumbing. Although I must confess, you know, my, I, I talked to uh, um, my, my, my Stan Fisher, my PhD advisor, about this once, and he said, you know, I grew up 
He, was, he, he grew up in part of Rhodesia. He said, well, I grew up, we didn't have indoor plumbing. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> uh, personally, I'd be, I'd be very hard pressed to give up indoor plumbing. Um, so, so Gordon's view is that this, the, the, the sort of inventions that people are inventing now are, aren't just as life-changing as previous, previous inventions. I mean, Elon Musk is a great entrepreneur, but he's not quite Thomas Edison, right? Have, it's great that we have you know, a Tesla going around the sun in, a, in an endless orbit, but the light bulb was really more life-changing. <laughs> now, some evidence for this comes from a paper by Nick Bloom and Chad Jones, John Van Rienen, and Michael Webb, where they, they make a very, very simple point. One thing we all know is that productivity growth has been kind of slow. But the most the amazing fact they point to is the number of researchers in the economy has increased tremendously. The number of re researchers in the US economy since the 1930s has increased more than 20-fold. We have 20 times as many people trying to generate new ideas. And this is all sorts of research, government research, private research, university research. So this, we have 20 times as many people trying to generate good ideas, and, but productivity growth is, is kind of eh. What is, how do you interpret that fact? Well, their, their interpretation is that ideas are just getting harder to find. To find the next good idea, you just need a lot of, a, a lot of researchers. Or when researchers are researching, the ideas they're generating are kind of small ideas, they're not big ideas. Another piece of evidence that's consistent with this view is that this, productiv this, this falling productivity growth story is, is true around the world. It's not just the United States that's having lower productivity growth in historical, historically. All economies at the technological frontier, the major developed economies, are experiencing slower uh, productivity growth. And it does suggest that whatever the explanation is, it's not a specific thing having to do with American policies or American institutions, but rather a phenomenon uh, that, that's worldwide. And this idea that inventors aren't just aren't doing stuff as cool as previous generations it sort of can help explain that. So those are the explanations I think for slower growth in average incomes. What about this other phenomenon I talked to you about, which is slower growth in productivity? Here I think the it's, it's a little harder to know what the right answer is, but I'm going to give you my, my best guess or several guesses I have as to the forces at work driving ri rising inequality. The best explanation, my single favorite explanation, comes in this book here by two of my Harvard colleagues, Claudia Gold and Larry Katz, and they basically summarize their conclusion in their title, which I just want to, I love this book. You don't have to read the title, and you kind of got it. The Race Between Education and Technology. Their story is that technology tends to be a force causing inequality to rise. And the reason is that when technology advances, the easiest thing for technology to do is find stuff to replace unskilled workers, to automate things done by unskilled workers. So what, what, think, of an think of an example. I have, a, I have a friend who's an electrical engineer. He programs automatic teller machines. So that automatic teller machines has basically created his job. He's a skilled worker. But what do automatic teller machines do? They, re they replace hundreds of thousands of people who are tellers when I was a child, well, you need, who, who now would wait in line with, for a human being to get some money from the bank, right? That's a crazy idea. We just go to the machine. There's a robot, basically, who's doing it for us. Similarly, we're inventing other things. I went to a restaurant at, at an airport a few months ago. You know, I think of a waiter as a job that was a pretty good job for a relatively unskilled person. Well, at this restaurant, they'd replace most of the waiters. You sit down at your table. You or, you, your menu's on an iPad. You, you type into the iPad what you want. Then a real human being brings out your food. But even when you pay the bill, the no waiter shows up again. There's another machine at, your, at the table. They just swipe your credit card, and you pay your bill that way. So they replace two-thirds of the tasks the waiters do with the machine. Think of what's going to happen to all the Uber drivers when self-driving cars come into being in a few years, or all the truck drivers when self-driving trucks come in. So we're constantly finding new ways to turn, uh, to, to replace uh, unskilled workers with technology. That's what we're going to reduce the demand for unskilled workers and tend to depress their wages. Golden and Katz say that the other participant in this tug of war, the other end of the rope, is education. Because what education does is it turns unskilled workers into skilled workers. Right? That's presumably why you are in, you're here, right? You're, you're students, not the professors. While your students are here, right, you're, you're, you're trying to turn yourself from an unskilled worker into a skilled worker so you can get the benefit of the, of the skill premium. But when we educate more people, it's also good for the uh, for unskilled workers because when unskilled workers become skilled workers, there's fewer unskilled workers competing for the unskilled jobs that remain, 
and that tends to raise the wages of the unskilled. So when you become a skilled worker, not only are you benefiting yourself when you become a skilled worker, you also benefit the people you leave behind in the unskilled labor pool by reducing the supply of them. So that's the story. It's, it's this co constant race between technology and education. And according to Golden and Katz, early in the 20th century, education was winning the race. And recently, we've let technology win the race. Here's, here's a picture from their studies. This shows you years of schooling by year of birth. So if you're an American born in 1870, you probably had about seven years of schooling. If you're an average American today, you have about 13 or so years of schooling. And there's been a pretty steady increase of this. Pretty steady, but not completely steady. And in particular, recently it's slowed down. And you can see that if we kept going at the previous pace, the average American today would have a year or two more schooling than in fact they do. And it's that slowdown, according to Golden and Katz, that has allowed technology to start winning the race between education and technology. Now here's, some, here's a chart from David Otter, a professor at MIT. This shows you a sort of growth in earnings. This is men on the left, women on the right. Stories are similar, but not exactly the same. It shows you growth in, in earnings since 1963 by educational attainment. So here you, you see high school dropout. So a high school dropout today is earning a little bit less than a high school dropout would have earned in 1963. You see a college graduate today is earning about 40% more, and someone with a, with, a, with a graduate degree is earning about 90% more than their counterparts in 1963. Again, similar stories, stories for women. So it's great that you're here in college, but consider graduate school. <laughs> this is completely consistent with the Golden and Cat story combination of skilled bias technological change has allowed, has allowed um, the, the skill to take off from the unskilled. And notice, by the way, when this happens, we had growth in sort of all of these categories. Let's see, growth in all these categories from 63 to the 1970s. And it's exactly in the 1970s when we saw inequality start increasing, where these start fanning out. So these start fanning out in the 1970s precisely when inequality starts rising. So in my mind, this is the single most important explanation for rising inequality, the race between education and technology. But it's not the only force at work. So let me mention three other forces that I think are contributing to rising inequality in addition to this one. Oh, before I get to that, let me talk about the election. Go back to the election for a second. This shows you who voted for Trump and who voted for Hillary. Among college-educated people, which is up here, Hillary won by nine percentage points. Among people without college educations, Trump won by eight percentage points. There's a huge gap in, in how college and non-college educated people voted. Notice that this huge gap is, is, is very different from previous elections. In previous elections, whether you ask the college educated or non-college educated to vote, they would have reached the same conclusion. In this election, the college educated and the non-college educated reach completely different conclusions. Now, of course, there's different ways to interpret this. One, if, you, if you're a real Hillary supporter, you'd say, yeah, I knew those Trump people were idiots. But, no, but another explanation is that the people who didn't have college degrees were experiencing a different economy. They were experiencing an economy where, where wages were not growing, where the, the, the American dream particularly seemed to be fading. And those are the people who wanted to shake things up. Those are the people who really felt they needed to make America great again, because they've been living a different experience than the people with college degrees. OK, so that sort of connects the Otter evidence, the Golden and Katz story, and, and, the, and the recent election. Let me go on to some other explanations for rising inequality. I think globalization is part of it. Um, we, 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 the United States is a country that is, tends to have a lot of skilled workers, so we tend to export things with, that have a high skill content. We tend to import things that are produced by unskilled workers because unskilled workers are abundant abroad. That pattern of trade means that the demand for unskilled workers in the United States falls and the demand for skilled workers rises when trade expands. So glo globalization increases in trade probably has contributed to rising inequality. On the other hand, we, we should be careful not to be too hard on globalization because we know, I think from basic economics, in fact, it's chapter three, if you remember. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Cha we know from basic economics that trade allows countries to be better off on average. So, so even while some people may end up with a smaller slice of pie, the overall pie is getting bigger. 
And I think that's how most economists think of it. This is actually a poll of economists. Um, and basically, the first question asks economists, trade with China makes most Americans better off. And absolutely every single economist they asked agreed. It was a poll of several dozen prominent economists. But then they asked the same economists, but aren't some Americans worse off because of trade with China? And again, virtually everyone agreed. So I think the basic story about trade is, yes, trade is, bad, is good for the average person, but, but it's, not, it's not necessarily good for every single person. Um, and I think, that, uh, I think that's something to keep in mind as we think about policy responses. Oh, well, I want to kind of pause and digress for a moment on that graphic up here. This, is, this, this particular graphic is taken from the most recent edition of my textbook. You can see that that, 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 that that graphic we have, which is new, has Alex Trebek there in little Jeopardy pose with three contestants, which you can see on the, from the left are Adam Smith, Milton Friedman, and John Maynard Keynes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, superstars. This is a f great famous paper by Sherwin Rosen in the early 1980s in the American Economic Review and said that there are certain professions that technology allows superstars to develop. And a superstar is basically somebody who's at the top of their game and as a result can command a huge share of the market. So this is Robert Downey Jr. in The Avengers. He played Iron Man in The Avengers. For that one movie, for the, one, for the movie The Avengers, Robert Downey Jr. was paid $50 million. Took, took him a few months to film it. He was paid, he was paid $50 million. To give you some sense of how much money that is, the average American worker to make $50 million would have to work for more than 1,000 years. It's a long time. So $50 million is, is, is a lot of money. How did he do it? He did, he, here's, it's, here's the basic economics of it. He had a share of the revenue. Roughly 200 million people worldwide saw the Avengers. Everybody who bought a ticket to see the Avengers 20, had to pay basically 25 cents to Robert Downey Jr. My guess is when they left the theater, they, if you'd asked them, they would have said, yeah, it was a good performance. It was worth 25 cents. Because it was a good performance. So nobody felt really ripped off. And he only charged them 25 cents. Well, 25 cents doesn't sound like very much. But 25 cents is a lot of money if you, if you can figure out a way to have 200 million customers. Most people in most occupations cannot have 200 million customers. If you're the world's best plumber, you may be in high demand, but there's no way you're going to have 200 million customers. The world's best barbers, no way you can have 200 million customers. But if the world's best actor, you can, because technology allows him to make a movie and send it around the world at basically zero cost, so literally everybody can enjoy it. You know, similarly, think of singers. Most, the average singer doesn't pay anything for singing. They sing for free in the shower, and they annoy their spouse doing it. But Taylor Swift, because she can sing a song and, and send it basically around the entire world, like Robert Downey Jr. sends his movies, you know, it makes, I don't know, $70 million a year or something like that. So technology has allowed superstars to develop in some markets. And I think there's been a growth of superstars, although it's, it's, it is hard to measure. Oh, and finally, I think one of the things going on is the, the women's movement, the sort of mating. I've talked, um, you know, you're, you're, you're here at this elite school. This is, you know, this is a, not only a great place to get a great education, it's a pretty good place to find a life partner. Um, and let's, let's, let's talk about why that's important. Um, Here's some, data I, here's some data I pulled from a sociology journal. And what this shows you is the correlation of uh, husbands' incomes and wives' incomes. So if you look over here, you see today there's a positive correlation between husbands' incomes and wives' incomes. And that's not so surprising, right? The successful doctor, lawyer, banker marries another successful doctor, lawyer, banker. And so therefore, you get a positive correlation between husbands' and wives' incomes. But notice here back a long time ago, when I was a kid, there was a negative correlation between husbands' incomes and wives' incomes. Now, you people, you, you students are too young to remember that, but you've probably seen Leave it to Beaver. So think of this one now, we're in the Leave it to Beaver era. And what happens when Ward Cleaver comes home and he says, June, I got a raise. She says, that's great. I don't need to work anymore. I can now stay home with the kids. And this is basically what's going on here. The, the more successful the husband, usually the husband was the primary worker back then, less obviously not true today in many cases. But the more successful the husband, the more likely it was that the woman would drop out of the labor force. And as a result, there was a negative correlation between the income of the husband and the income of the wife. What has this done? Well, if you have, a pos if you have two incomes in a household and there's a positive correlation between them, then they're going to pull away. High income households are going to pull away relative to low income households. So the negative correlation was a stabilizing force in household incomes, and the positive correlation is a destabilizing force, pushing people apart. 
Okay, so those are my hypotheses, uh, and I think there's some truth to um, all of them. The question is, what do we do about these trends? Well, one thing we might want to do, now that we understand the forces at work, let's address the root causes. The first thing you recognize is that many of these root causes are very, very hard to change. Right? It'd be great to tell Elon Musk, stop just sending Teslas revolving around the Earth's sun. Why don't you go invent something really cool like Thomas Edison did? But he's really doing the best he can. It's, not, it's probably not his fault that he hasn't quite, he's, he's obviously a tremendously creative guy, but the, fa but the fact that PayPal is not as quite as great as the light bulb, that's not his fault. He's, doing, he's really doing the best he can. So we really can't tell people to invent better stuff. We're not going to tell women to enter the labor force again, because you, they can't. They've already entered once, they can't enter a second time. We're not going to tell the baby boomers don't retire, get to keep working because we're worried about GDP growth. We're kind of getting old and tired. It's our turn. So, a lot, so, so those demographic forces are hard to change. Skill bias technological change is hard to change. We're not going to tell inventors, stop replacing unskilled workers. Why don't you invent some stuff to make unskilled workers more productive? Why don't you invent some stuff to replace skilled workers? But they can't really control what they invent. They invent what they can invent. It's just easier to invent, automate stuff that unskilled workers are doing. This is e more easily automatable. So you really can't do that. We're not going to tell people to, to stop doing a sort of domain. We're not going to say, I know you're an investment banker making a lot of money, but what if you do? Don't marry another investment banker. That's going to make inequality worse. Go marry yourself a poet just to solve the inequality problem. <laughs> right? We're not going to stop that. So a lot of the forces at work are really beyond control. Now, we could change globalization, but as I said, that's not such a great idea either because globalization does make the overall pie bigger even if it does contribute to inequality. So that might, so reversing globalization might help the inequality issue, but it's going to make the growth issue worse. So what can we do? Education. That's one thing I talked about that we haven't, that, that we, maybe we can change. And I think education is the thing that we should really focus our attention on. More human capital can both promote economic growth, because human capital is an input into growth, and it can also ameliorate inequality by changing the mix of skilled and unskilled workers. A couple caveats. Patience is required. Jim Heckman, the Will Prize winner at the University of Chicago, has said that the best way we can provide more human capital to people is to provide better preschool for kids who are from underprivileged families. Let's suppose Jim is right. It's controversial, but let's suppose he's right. And let's suppose we, come, we, inter we intervene with the absolute best preschool program ever imagined, and it's completely successful. Well, these three and four-year-olds who are benefiting from these preschool progr programs aren't going to enter the labor force for 20 more years. So you're not going to see any of the economic benefits of this for a couple decades. So we, yes, we need to focus on education, but don't, it's not a quick fix by any stretch of the imagination. The other ca caveat I call, might Brian Kaplan be right? There's a new book that just came out a, uh, a few weeks ago called The Case Against Education. And so if those of you who read my textbook, you, you know that there's really two views of education. One is the human capital view, which is what I've been promoting for most of today. The other is the signaling view, that human capital doesn't really make people more productive. It just helps employers sort between productive and non-productive people intrinsically. Kaplan basically, his book argues that it's basically it's all signaling, and therefore most of education is a waste of time and money. I, I hope to God he's wrong. I think he's wrong, but I will end at least the possibility that I'm wrong and he's right. So that's, I'll leave that as, just as a caveat. Now, one thing we can do to increase the, the educational content of the labor force is to allow more skilled workers in. The debate over immigration is infinitely complicated. It's got a lot of facets, and I'm not going to go into that today. The debate over skilled immigration is, I think, relatively straightforward. I think uh, all the downsides that people point out about unskilled immigration really just don't apply to skilled immigrants. My own view is that if, if you're a foreign student, you graduate from an American university, as you get your diploma, we should be giving you a green card with it, encouraging you to stay. <laughs> now, the other thing we can do, the other thing we can do is not worry about the root causes, but we can say, OK, fine, we have a slow growth, rising inequality. Let, let's use the tax system to do something. All the data, by the way, I gave you on incomes was all before tax incomes. Okay. 
So we could focus on the tax system. And here's some data on the, on the progressivity of tax system. This is the tax rates paid by, the, well, this is the lowest quintile, the middle class, and the top 1% uh, over since 1979. So you see that today, well, this is not, not quite today, this is 2000, the most recent data, 2013. The middle class pays about 14% of their income in taxes. The top 1% pays 34%. And you can see that there are fluctuations in, in you see a couple things here. One is that this is, we've always had a progressive tax system. This is all federal taxes, including payroll taxes, income taxes. Um, so we've always had a progressive federal tax system. The degree of progressivity does vary a little bit depending on who's in power. So you see that uh, Ronald Reagan cut taxes on, on the rich, Bill Clinton raised taxes on the rich, George W. Bush cut taxes on the rich, and Barack Obama raised taxes on the rich. And I presume this is coming down a little bit um, under, under the recent tax bill, although the data is not available for that yet. I'm not going to sit here arguing about Barack Obama versus Ronald Reagan's tax plan, uh, but I do want to point out one thing. What's the difference between Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama's tax plan? It's basically the difference between 27 and 34 percent tax rates for the top 1 percent. So that's about a 7 percentage point difference in, the pay, in taxes paid to the rich. That's not insignificant. But remember earlier on when I said, when we're looking at these changes in the top 1 percent income. The top 1% in, in, income went from 10% of total income to 20% of total income. They doubled the share, their share of total income. That's, that's huge compared to this 7% tax rate. So there is, so, so we, we can debate about Barack Obama versus Ronald Reagan, but it, the, 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 that difference is small compared to the huge differences in before tax incomes that we've seen in previous, in previous data. Now one of the most difficult problems that we uh, face uh, is this one here. There's a famous book by Arthur Oaken, Equality and Efficiency, the Big Trade-Off. He could have called this Equality versus Growth, the Big Trade-Off. And the basic idea here is that, yes, we can use the system of taxes and transfers to try to m achieve more equality, but if we do that, we're going to blunt incentives, and that's going to make the economy less efficient. It's going to reduce economic growth. Or we can try to reform the tax system to make the tax system more efficient to uh, get better incentives, but the, well, one side effect of that might be reduced equality. And so in uh, Oaken's view, um, that was sort of the big trade-off face of a policy. I think this is particularly important to keep in mind now. Because remember I said we face two big problems, slow growth and rising inequality. Using the tax system to address one is going to make the other problem worse. I think focusing on education can ameliorate both problems. But if we use the, simply use a system of taxes and transfers, we could do it to uh, focus on inequality. We could do it to fo focus on growth, but we can't probably use the tax system to do both at the same time. Now, we have a recent tax cut. My, uh, uh, Donald Trump, when he's asked what he wants to call the tax cut, said he wants to call it the Cut, Cut, Cut Act. <laughs> the House of Representatives thought that wasn't dignified enough. So they, in fact, they call it the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And, um, my reading of, of that uh, act is that in this equality efficiency debate, they were really more focused on efficiency than equality. They're more focused on trying to get economic growth up than, than on combating or rising inequality. And let me just say a few words about it since it's been in the news uh, lately. Um, there's some good things about it I like. Uh, I like the fact they've got a lower corporate tax rate. I like the fact they've reformed the nature of the corporate tax to be territorial rather than global. I won't go into detail about that now, just in the interest of time. I like the base broadening, uh, the reducing the mortgage interest deduction, uh, reducing the uh, state and local tax deduction, even though it really screws California. By the way, you guys in California are really screwed under this act. I'm sorry to say, but it's true. Um, so I think, there's, I think there's some good things in it. The worst thing in it, to me, is that it loses much too much revenue. The budget deficits are getting too big, and I'm really worried about that. I'm worried about the long-term fiscal imbalance. Um, and this is some ugly provisions of it. I think this is going to invite a lot of gaming because there's all different tax rates for different kinds of income now, and it's, and it's going to be a field day for tax accountants to try to how game the system. So I think it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, and people, people say whether well, I like it or don't like it, I really have trouble giving a simple answer because there's some things I like and some things I hate. Um, if, I were to, if I were to try to reform the taxes to myself, sometimes people ask me that, I would have cut all income taxes much more than this and, re, and, re, and replaced replace them with another kind of tax 
but I think it's much less distortionary. I think it's something like a consumption tax, like a value added tax, or a carbon tax. And I have a whole other lecture I could give you on climate change, but I'm, I'm, I'm taxing your patience already, so I'm not, I won't go into that. We'll go with that now. <laughs> yes, it was a pun. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Now, I always feel at this point in the uh, talk, I, feel, I start feeling kind of bad because I feel like I've, I'm going to leave you depressed. And I feel, as I said, oh, we have these two problems. And most of the forces causing these problems are things we can't fix. And we do have certain tools. And the, ones, the tools we have, like education, are really hard to do and, and really slow acting. And the tax system really is not very useful at fixing both problems simultaneously. And if I just stopped right there, I feel you should just go home and want to slit your wrist. So I, don't, I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to end with some good news. I want to end with some good news. OK, so here's the first piece of good news I want to leave you with. This is showing people living in deep poverty. So poverty, when we talk about world poverty, is a very different thing when we talk about poverty in the United States. This is people living on less than $2 a day. And you see that the percentage of people living on less than $2 a day has fallen precipitously during your, our lifetime. That's incredibly good news. Why is that happening? It's happening b largely because of growth in parts of Asia, particularly China and India. Probably more people have been pulled out of deep poverty because of growth in China in the past several decades than any event in human history. So this is extremely good news. Now, most American voters, if you tell them, yes, we have these problems, I'll get to questions in just a second. Most will say, most, m most American voters will say, um, uh, yes, we have these problems in the United States. If you, if you tell the voter, yes, we have problems, but don't worry, China's doing really great. That, that's really not a message that you would give if you're a politician. But since we're cosmopolitan citizens of the world, we should take solace in the fact that uh, growth uh, has been pulling more people out of poverty ever in human history. So that's one piece of good news. But even if you want some good news about the United States, let me leave you with this. Suppose you're an American living at the poverty line, something like $15,000 a year. You're an American living at the poverty line in the United States. That means you're poorer than 85% of other, other people in the United States. But you are still richer than 85% of people in the world. So even being poor in the United States is being rich by world standards. And if you compare yourself not just to other people in the world now, if you compare yourself to people who've ever lived throughout history, we're probably, you're probably richer than 99% of humans who have ever been born on this planet. So you're extremely fortunate even if you're maybe not as fortunate as the, as the people living down the street. So to get back to my topic, this hat, if I could revise this hat, I would just change one word. Make America grateful again. Because while we have our problems, we should remember that we are really extremely fortunate by the standards of, 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 of human history. Let me end there. And I'm happy to take questions on anything I said. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. There was, there was, I think I, well, we had a question over here, but before you, I think we have to talk into the mic. So I'll question. right over here. OK, yeah. Oh. So we'll open it up to questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And either Wesley or I will come and hand you the mic. Priority goes to students. Um, I was just wondering if your uh, poverty graph was two real dollars. Yes, it was two. Yes, it okay. was real dollars. It was Absolutely, yes. It was a total adjusted inflation. inflation. Thank you. That was a good, a good clarifying question. Uh, hello, Dr. Menke. Thank you so much for coming to our college today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you for, for this amazing presentation. And I have a little bit maybe off-topic question, but uh, still, it is a very hot topic today since cryptocurrency market at the current point of time for $153 billion about an hour ago is bigger than the largest uh, U.S. bank, uh, which is owned by Mitsubishi um, Financial Division. And, you know, it's, it's moving somewhere. And I would like to ask you, where is it moving? Thank you. Where is the, crypto, uh, where is the, where is the cryptocurrency m market moving? I have no idea. I will say that I have a, I know uh, my position in Bitcoin, I monitor very closely. It's exactly zero. <laughs> it's always been zero. <laughs> I, I, and I, would <laughs> I wouldn't recommend anybody choose a different position, because it does seem like one big bubble to me. Um, but I'm always prepared to believe I'm wrong. 
Um, and certainly there are people who made a lot of money in this, but I, f I, I fear it, the whole thing is gonna, is gonna collapse. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put, it, put any, 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 any money on it. But maybe I'm just an old fuddy-duddy and I don't really see the virtues, virtues of this. Thank you. Thank you mo so much for talking. Um, I was happy to hear that you spent your summers on Long Beach Island. I also spent my summers on Long Beach Island. Oh, really? Island. Very good. Small world, greatest coastline in New Jersey. Did you ever go um, to Fury Sailing? What's that? Did you ever go to Fu Fury Sailing? You know what Fury Sailing is? Uh, I've never, okay, well, I've sailing. never gone sailing it's on LBI. It's a small LBI. sailing rental place on Long Beach Island called Fury Sailing. That's what's, where I got street? my first job teaching, sa giving sailing lessons, actually. What, what street is it on? Or like what town? Uh, <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's Beach Haven Terrace, I think. Okay. Yeah, so sort of right cool. in the middle of the island. Okay. I'm from North Beach Haven. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so my question actually pertains to um, two different theories I've heard about, like declining real wages. So the first um, would be declining firm dynamism in the United States. Um, and then the second theory I've heard about is declining labor share of productivity. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk maybe a little bit about your evaluation of those two theories and maybe why you chose not to factor them into um, your uh, presentation today. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I think there are, other, there are other forces at work that people have, have, have been talking about. And, and you know, in terms of firm dynamism, the, some people believe, it, it's, hard, it's very hard to judge this, but some people believe that um, it, it's harder to enter markets, create new firms uh, than in the past. And some evidence that sort of firm creation is, is lower than it has been in, in, pre in previous periods of time. To the extent that's true, and to the extent that it's driven by policy, things like regulation, then maybe some of the deregulatory policies the Trump administration is pursuing might make some sense. There has been declines in, in the um, in labor share. I don't think it's the main driving force of rising inequality. I think it's a, that's a, that's a more recent and a, and a smaller phenomenon than some of the data that I showed you. But that is an interesting phenomenon that people have been studying. One explanation that some people have put forward is rising um, monopoly power, on the, on, on, which could be consistent with reduced firm, firm dynamism. The, the, the demo, and the question is, and if, if that, first of all, there's a question of whether that's true. Are, are markups bigger than they have been in the past? And is that because of more market, more market power? And if so, why is there more market power? And so all these are sort of open questions that we don't really know the answers to. Um, interestingly, that the, the Senator Schumer, the leading Democrat in the Senate, obviously comes to the view that it's policy driven because part, part of his new better deal plan that he, um, he announced I don't know, maybe six months, a year ago, was included a variety of provisions, but one of them was more active antitrust enforcement. His view was that the policymakers had allowed mergers too readily and that, that had reduced, redu reduced competition. Maybe that's right. Another possibility is that differences in the nature of products that we're producing that compared to what, what's happened in the past. There's a lot of products now that are basically information-based products. Think of things like making a movie, or Robert Downey Jr. makes a movie. Microsoft makes, writes, writes, writes software. Um, I write a textbook. Basically, all, all of that, all that activity is very, very big fixed costs and very, very low marginal costs by its nature. Or pharmaceutical companies, they invent a drug. A lot of research into the drug, once it's invented, producing the drug is pretty cheap. All those things are big fixed costs, low marginal costs. Those things intrinsically will have large markups. And, and it's possible that we're moving more towards that kind of product relative to the old traditional products that, with which normal competition pre prevails. Um, but that's, those, that's, those are all very speculative. I'm less, I'm less those, those could be important, but I'm less sure. So I sort of gave you things that I'm pretty sure are part of the story as opposed to things that might be part of the story. Y yes. Hi, thank you for speaking with us. I'm curious as to why you still believe that skills-based technological change is the best explanation for rising American income inequality, despite a lot of criticism that the theory has received in recent years, including the fact that all the factors that would lead to, lead to skills-based technological change have occurred in other developed countries, but with the exception of the UK to a much smaller extent, those countries haven't experienced a rise in income inequality that within group income inequality hasn't really increased in the same period, despite the fact that we would think if you have an education but you're of the same income group, there should be a divergence from people of that same income group who don't based on the SBTC thesis. And also the fact that the vast, vast majority of the increase in inequality has been concentrated at the very, very top rather than just a divergence of kind of the two halves of educated and uneducated away from each other. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, 
as I said, I think, it's, I think skill buys technological change is part of the story. I don't think it's, I don't think it's the, 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 all, the overall story. Trying to understand the differences across countries is important, but I don't think we fully understand that. It is true that a lot of this has happened at the very top. As I showed you, the people at the very top are, are um, taking a, a lion's share at the top 1%, top 0.01%. I'm, 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 I'm not as convinced that that's not skill bias, technological change. Because even among people who have the same level of formal education, there's different levels of skill. You know, two people may have the MBA from the same business school. That doesn't mean they're both going to be equally well suited to be CEOs. They're going to they're have different levels of skill. One of them is going to become the CEO. Others are going to be stuck as assistant vice president. Um, and th that, th that could still be a skill bias, technological change story. Now, CEO pay is sort of one example of this. And it's a very small part because obviously there's only 500 CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, so, it's, so there's not that many of them. But there's a literature on CEO pay. CEO pay is um, much higher in the United States than it is in, say, Japan. Why is that? Well, there's a, couple, there's a couple theories as to why CEO pay is so high. One is that the CEOs here are taking advantage of shareholders by putting their friends on the board of directors, and their friends are giving themselves excessive pay. That's sort of what I think of sort of the left-wing explanation for, for those evil CEOs overpaying themselves. Uh, I actually don't buy that. I don't buy it for the, following, for the following reason. If you're a private equity firm taking over a company and you're, and, and, and you're, and you're, and you're hiring the CEO for your company that you own, you are now the shareholder because you're the private equity firm, you're not going to overpay the C CEO because it's your money you're overpaying him with. But in fact, private equity firms pay, pay CEOs in the United States a lot. Just, just as the public companies do. So I don't actually think it's the principal agent problem with the board of directors. Um, there is another theory of CEO pay, which is due to uh, Javier Gebex, uh, which is that as companies get bigger and more dynamic, the value of the, having the right CEO is, is, is more important. And so his view is this, it's the nature of American capitalism that's driving CEO pay up. So the story, I'm, I, I have no particularly emphasized CEO pay here because it's only a small part of the story, but the Gebex explanation for CEO pay is, I think, consistent with the kind of skill bias technological change story that I'm pushing here. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, I had two questions, both about your prescriptive tax plan. Uh, the first concerned your, um, your concerns about the rising deficit in the US. I was wondering what you see as so the, the long what? deficit in yes, the US. So yes. And what you see is a long run upper bound for the capacity for, for the US to borrow, given both the systemic, systemic importance of the US economy and the sort of bedrock uh, role played by US government debt in the financial world uh, that might sort of create long run very sticky demand for large amounts of US government debt. Uh, and then secondly, you advocated a shift away from income taxes, which can be more progressive towards consumption taxes, which are often more regressive. And I was curious about what you thought about the relative incidence of those cons cons consumption taxes across the population. Um, to th okay, so let me, let me start with the deficit. I, I am very worried about the deficit, not just because of this tax bill, I'm worried about the deficit because of structural fiscal problems that existed long before Mr. Trump uh, that, he, that, that he inherited but hasn't really focused in on. In particular, my generation of baby boomers has, has promised ourselves a certain level of benefits when we retire in the form of Social Security and Medicare and to some degree Medicaid to the extent it pays for nursing homes. So we promised ourselves a certain level of benefits, but we haven't figured out ways to pay for that. We basically promised that the next generation, you students, are going to pay for the benefits that we promised ourselves. As a result, if you look, look at even before this recent tax, CBO projections of the fiscal imbalance, it's going to get worse and worse. Debt's going to keep rising as a share of GDP. And this, budget, this tax cut um, only made things uh, worse. So I actually am very, I'm very concerned. I don't have a particularly metric number that you know, after, after X percent of GDP, all hell breaks loose. I think that's partly based on market psychology. At what point does the does the uh, does the, the Fed bond market look at the United States and say, "Oh, you know, you guys aren't any different from Greece"? Uh, I think it's, there's, there is a point in which that could happen and will happen. I don't think we're there yet, but it concerns me. Uh, I think the most likely scenario is that we're going to end up raising taxes in the future, and I suggested a couple taxes that I think we should be focusing on. Now you mentioned the progressivity of taxes. It how um, when you think about the progressivity of tax, you have to think not only about how the money is raised, but how the money is spent. And so to give you an example of a carbon tax, um, in, 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 in my other lecture, I have a, 
um, in my other lecture on carbon taxes, I talk about a plan that I proposed with George Schultz, uh, Hank Paulson, um, Jim Baker, and Marty Feldstein. Uh, it's, it's, and our plan was through a group called, called the Climate Leadership Council. And um, the plan that we proposed for the carbon tax was to put a carbon tax on to deal with climate change, roll back lots of regulations that are no longer necessary once you pr put a price on carbon, and then use the carbon tax revenue to rebate lump sum back to people. So since you know, richer people have bigger cars, bigger houses to heat and so on, they have bigger carbon footprints, so they're gonna pay more in this tax, everybody gets the same rebate. So the whole plan could, could be um, uh, progressive even if the tax part itself is proportional. Similarly, with a, if, I were, if I were designing the world from scratch, if, if I were saying, okay, I have a brand new society, I have no history, I don't have to, I, I can design the tax, the fiscal system all by, um, what would I do? I personally think the optimal system would be a, a value, raising revenue through a value added tax, a flat consumption tax. It may be a carbon tax too, but let's put global warming aside for, for the moment. Um, a flat consumption tax, and then use some of the flat consumption tax to give people lump sum rebates in the form of like a universal basic income. So that, that, that would have flat marginal tax rates, but have progressive average tax rates once you take into account the lump sum uh, rebate. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on career and technical education in that it seems to uh, more directly address the caveats for education and that there's more immediacy and it would provide a distinction that would address Kaplan's concern. Yeah, I mean, Kapl Kaplan is big into that, actually, the Kapl Kaplan book. Um, Kaplan's arguments, a lot of Kaplan's arguments to me struck me as hopelessly um, I don't know if to, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to choose an adjective. It's, it's too insulting. But, 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 but well, hey, let me give you the nature of some of the arguments. He says things like, look at all these people who go to high school and have uh, studied Latin. Whoever uses Latin in their day-to-day -day life? Nobody talks Latin anymore. Or he says, think about trigonometry. It's few people use trigonometry, but almost nobody uses trigonometry. How about a fraction of adults use trigonometry? But they all go, go to school and learn trigonometry. What a waste of time. And it's true that if you think that, uh, aha, um, we, we're supposed to learn specific things and apply them directly to our job, and that's what education is about, then a lot of the things, we, the academic skills we learn seem hopelessly re, un, uh, unusable. My own view of education is it's training your mind to think in ways to solve problems, to express itself, and the more ways we train that mind by learning Latin and trigonometry, even when you come to problems that aren't either Latin or trigonometry, your mind will be better prepared for it. Uh, so I'm, 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 more, I, I, I'm more open, sympathetic to sort of pure academic stuff. Let me sort of give, let me, I, I read the psychology experiment that somebody, that somebody did recently. Um, they were, they were tr you're, you're training people to throw, this is gonna be a bit of a stretch, by the way. Uh, you're, 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 you're training people to throw bean bags into a bucket. And we're gonna split the class up into two groups. One group is gonna have the bucket always three feet away and throw the bean bag into the, the bucket three feet away. That's the only thing they're gonna practice doing. The other group is gonna practice two different things. Sometimes they're gonna throw the bean bag into a bucket two feet away, and sometimes they're gonna throw the bean bag into the bucket four feet away. And so they're practicing two different distances. After we, ha after we spend the given the month doing this, that'd be like worse experiment ever to be a subject. Uh, but anyway, after we have a month for doing, this, doing this practice, we're then gonna give them a test. And the test is gonna be, how well can you throw a bean bag into a bucket three feet away? It's the exact thing the first group was only practicing, the second group never practiced that. They only did two and four feet. And believe it or not, it's the second group that did better. Because they were practicing diverse set of skills, two and four feet, and as a result, their skills developed better rather than doing the same task over and over again. So I, I actually think that sort of your, your, your brain, and so now I'm gonna jump from throwing bean, bean bags into your brain, but I think when you actually learn things, your brain changes in ways that makes you uh, learn, your ability to learn other things better. And so I don't, I don't think the time we spend teach, teaching trigonometry and Latin is really wasted. I don't think we fully understand 
how the, how the brain learns enough to fully understand why it's important, but I, in my heart of hearts, I really believe it, it, it is, and I think that those, this is why Brian Kaplan's arguments sort of left me a little cold. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, so I'm interested to hear your thoughts on both um, the recent debates about NAFTA and the result of the administration's um, uh, <laughs> actions about TPP, um, and also just what your thoughts are about uh, how the American government can use economic institutions, international economic institutions, to continue to reduce the rate of global poverty. Um, yeah, I actually, th I, I think of all the things the Trump administration has done, with perhaps the exception of, of, of prompting uh, North Korea into a, you know, a nuclear war. Um, putting that aside, uh, I, I think the retreat from the global consensus of, of free trade uh, is one of the most regrettable. Um, and that, com that comes with the recent tariffs, the recent announcement that they were thinking about quotas in steel, the, rever the, the, um, the n pulling out of TPP. Uh, so, I so I think all that stuff is very regrettable. I should point out, by the way, that the, the, the populism that Trump tapped into is not new. I don't know if people remember this back when Barack Obama first got elected. He talked about wanting to renegotiate NAFTA. I remember his, 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 his economic advisor, Austin Goolsby, got a little bit of hot water during the campaign because Austin Goolsby went up to Canada and said, don't worry about it, we're not going to do that. And, uh, and that was considered very, because he basically announced during the campaign that they, they, this was all just politics. He wasn't taking, didn't take it seriously. But obviously, Barack Obama thought he had to appeal to that popular sentiment during the campaign. Now, as it turned out, Goolsby was right. Once he got elected, he didn't actually renegotiate NAFTA. Didn't do much at all. I actually believe, it, it, I think what Hillary Clinton did. Hillary Clinton, having helped negotiate TPP as Secretary of State during the campaign, said, oh, it wasn't good enough. Now, I actually believe that she had gotten elected, she would have Hold, done the same thing that Obama did, which is to say, oh, I want to change this comma to a semicolon now. It's perfect. So I don't think, I actually don't believe that was a heartfelt. So, but, but, but both Clinton and Obama, as campaigners, tapped into that anti-trade populist sentiment uh, that Trump tapped into. The difference being that I think Trump actually believes it. And so I think he's actually doing, following through on what he said. Uh, and to me, that's, Heading in, heading in the wrong direction. I've, in fact, I've written that several. I've written several in the New York Times columns on that. The most recent one, just uh, two weeks ago, which you can which you can find on in the, in the New York Times website. Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Um, you're better situated than most to speak to the dynamic between the Council of Economic Advisors and the rest of the administration. Could you talk about kind of the recent events surrounding Ray Cohn, the Trump administration, and kind of how that dynamic has been playing out and its impacts and influences for the rest of uh, economic policy? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I spent two years as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, working with such great economists as Tom Kniesner. Um, uh, uh, actually, that was, that was the first time I was there. Actually, I, was, I spent three years at the Council of Economic Advisors. First worked with Tom Kniesner back in the Reagan administration, and the second time working for, for George, uh, George W. Bush. Um, The Council of Economic Advisors has no responsibility other than to give advice. We have to write this annual, annual report of the president. That's not all that big a deal. But what's really important, what we do, is give advice at meetings. If you're ever in the business of giving advice, what you know is your advice is useful only if people listening to it care. Now, I ne when, when, when I worked for George W. Bush, I never felt like he didn't care. I, 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 I got along very well with, with him and the rest of the economic team, Steve Friedman at the National Economic Council, John Snow at the Tre Secretary of the Treasury. And we were, we were we, I think we were quite close-knit, well-working well group. And so I never felt like giving good advice didn't matter because I think people did care. I have no idea whether Donald Trump cares. I mean, he tells us that he's got this big, stable brain. And so he doesn't, seem to, he doesn't seem to want advice in the same way that most politicians do. I also worked, by the way, for Mitt Romney during the, when he ran for president twice. Um, and I think he was interested in talking to economists. So I never felt like oh, I was wasting my time working for Mitt Romney. I don't know if I were working for Donald Trump whether uh, I'd feel like I was wasting my time. I've not seen a lot of Kevin Hassett in the public. But that, doesn't, but that really tells you very little about what's happening behind closed doors. 
So it's very hard for me to judge to what extent uh, the, the Council of Economic Advisors is having a big impact in this administration. Um, I'd be shocked if they were behind a lot of the trade stuff. They know Kevin Hess well enough to know that he's sort of a traditional economist on s issues like trade. Um, that doesn't mean he's not being listened to. He's, he's, uh, he's, he just he probably just lost out on this one. You mean, you, whenever you work in government, you don't expect to win every, every battle you fight. Um, and I, and I, it's, hard, it's hard to know what's going on uh, for outsiders. At some, at some point, we'll get some nice juicy tidbits when these people leave the administration or write their memoirs. But I haven't heard anything yet. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just interested in the Tax Cuts Act that was recently passed. Um, by most metrics, the economy right now is at or near full employment. It's doing pretty well. And uh, your textbook and many conventional economists would say right now it's the wrong time to introduce a fiscal stimulus right now. It'd be better to raise taxes instead of cut them. Um, do you see cutting taxes now as a bad move? And um, do you see the economy facing inflationary pressures in the near future as a result of the tax cut? Um, specific, although the economy right now um, doesn't seem to have high inflation. Um, I, I, as I mentioned, I'm worried about the deficit implications of the tax cut. I would have much rather have seen a, ta a deficit neutral tax reform. Um, and, I, and, I, and I would have been happy to give them some suggestions on how to do it. I have my, I have my own pr pr preferred tax system. So yes, I, I, I think a large increase in budget deficit at this particular point in time was probably not the right, the right move. Is inflation he heating up? I think there's a little bit of evidence that inflation is heating up. One of the big puzzles, by the way, I don't really know the answer to this, but over the past 10 years, inflation has been amazingly stable. It didn't really fall much during the big recession we had in 2008, and hasn't really risen much during the, very, during the recovery we've had since then. Both of those things are a little puzzling from the standpoint of traditional Phillips curves. So I don't really know the, uh, I don't really understand that. There is some evidence now that wages are starting to accelerate and that will eventually translate to somewhat higher inflation. But it's still preliminary evidence and not tremendously con conclusive. But other things equal, yes. A tax, a, 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 fis a fiscal stimulus when you're at full employment and the Fed's raising interest rates is probably other things equal going to be a little bit inflationary. Hi, um, um, thank you for, for, for coming today. Um, I had a question. So, one of the biggest concepts I got from, from your, your presentation was that education is the key to like a, ha a happy future. Um, so, my question is: have, have you given thought to like what kind of education we, we, we need, and like if there's any certain courses that needs to be in, in, introduced, or if you think and, and, and like what's, what's optimal amount of time for education that, that we should have? And yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Oh, that's a, you know, that's, that. a, that's a great, I, I, I don't. But I'll, 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 I'll say something about it anyway. Um, um, there's a lot of a great economists who study ec education. My, my favorite education economist is Carolyn Huxby at Stanford. If you haven't had her down for an SNEM, you should. She's fantastic. She would, she, she, so I'm sure she would have very specific ideas as to where we should spend money and how we should move resources around. Um, there's a lot of people who study, who study that. Uh, it's, an important, it's, it's tremendously important, I think, at all levels. But we've got to focus on you know, to what extent is preschool important, to what extent is higher ed important. I think it's both. The other question is how we finance more education. There, one, one of my favorite ideas floating around to financing education is this is an idea that Marco Rubio talked about when he ran for president, is to get more private investors involved in education. Right? You, you guys are studying finance here. Know that when you have, a, you have a venture, business venture, there's two ways to finance it. There's debt and equity. But when you go get a college degree, there's really only one way to do it, there's debt finance. So what Marco Ruby sa basically says, he's, this is not the way he puts it, by the way, this is the way I'm putting it. He says, L how about let's do some equity finance some people. Let's get some investors to come in and say, I will pay for your education in exchange for some equity in you. And what does that mean? They say, like, I'll pay for your four years at this great private college, which is probably, I don't know, I've not looked at tuition rates here, but I'm guessing it's expensive, right? <laughs> it's expensive. Right. Um, I'll pay for your four years at this private co great private college, and you give me 2% of your income for the next 30 years. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, that spreads the risk, right? It spreads some of the risk of the education between you and the investor, right? Debt leaves the businessman with all the risk. Equity spreads the risk around between the investor and the entrepreneur. 
So that's, what, that's one thing it does. But it also means that that investor now has an interest in you and your success. So he might say, you know, it would be great if this summer you got an internship. Let me help you find you, find you one. He says, let's look at what courses you're taking. Yeah, our history does look like fun, but what about economics? <laughs> they might have a slightly higher rate of return. So that would provide a mechanism where there'd be some outside person helping you decide what's the best way to use your four years here at this great school. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, it's also based on education and how, because you mentioned that we need education and we need an improvement in education necessarily. I think that that's very key, but how can we go about improving education given that we do have budget deficit um, concerns and we see that education, K through 12 more specifically, is always the first to get slashed when there are hard calls to make regarding deficits. Yeah, I mean, it's, a fair, it's a fairly common statement that a lot of economists and policymakers make that we should stop throwing money at education. I'm actually all in favor, I think, of throwing more money at education. If you look at the average SAT scores of people who go and become education majors and go on to being high school and grade school teachers, they tend to be below average. Education is not attracting the best students coming out of um, great, great colleges anymore. Why is that? I believe the wages we pay them is one of the reasons. And so I actually do think we should, on the one hand, figure out ways to fire bad teachers. And the, the whole debate as to how can we measure teacher performance and weed out the bad teachers. So I think we need to fire bad teachers and not say, oh, no matter how bad you are, you, get, you still have tenure for life. But at the same time, we need to pay the good teachers well to attract more good people into education and to stay in education. Um, and so I actually think we need to, f to find more way to do that. Um, where do you get the money for that? Well, that's an issue of tax policy. I don't have the, I don't have, I mean, I have, I have my favorite, favorite taxes, consumption taxes and carbon taxes. So I don't have any, I don't have any better answer when it comes to education. Uh, but I actually think throwing more money at education is probably the right way to do it. And it, it doesn't have, it, as I said from my previous answer, it doesn't have to be public money. I mean, some, some of it has to be public money if it's public schools, but some of it can be private money. We need to find more ways to get resources into education. Um, it doesn't be, it's very popular for, people are in, in advocating increased spending to call every increased spending an investment. And I think in ma most cases that's, um, that's probably not the right term. So when, when, when you know, Medicare pays for my uh, health care once I turn what, 62, I'm, it'd be a mistake to call that an investment in my future. It might be good for me, but it's probably an investment in the economy once I'm retired. But when, we, when we're paying money to education, I really do think of that as an investment. And I think the best evidence is that's got a pretty high rate of return. You mentioned your support for an increase in high-skilled education. I was wondering if you were worried at all on the brain drain effect of the, on the economies of the countries that those immigrants are leaving. Yeah, I worry about that a little bit. I do. Um, but one, th one, thing, one thing we know about immigration is that when people move from a low productivity country to a high productivity country, their wages go way up. So the benefit to the, to the worker who's immig immigrating is huge. In many cases, they can benefit people behind through remittances. And so I'm, I, I have, I'm fairly sympathetic to immigration, of, actually, of all sorts, because I think of, well, first of all, for, for a few reasons. Basically, it, part of the, part, the, the most, there's a lot of people who are affected by immigrate, when somebody immigrates. The person who's affected the most is the immigrant. If the immigrant wants to come here, and they, they're going to be better off. That is the, that's the, the single most important thing in my mind. Now, some people say that doesn't matter because they're not Americans. And I have a slightly more cosmopolitan view of morality than saying we only care about Americans. Um, if I thought immigrants badly hurt the United States, that would give me pause. But I don't think that's fundamentally true in most cases. Um, my, my favorite line about, it, about immig immigration uh, is one from Pat Paulson, and I'm sure uh, the faculty may remember who Pat Paulson is. I'm not sure none of the students know who Pat Paulson is. But Pat Paulson was a comedian who used to run for president every four years back in like the 1970s. And one of, the, one of his campaign lines was, every problem the United States faces today can be traced to an unenlightened immigration policy in the part of the American Indians. <laughs> and 
And that's, and I think that's basically a way to remind us that we're basically, for almost all of us, unless you happen to be Native American, almost all of us are children of immigrants. And I think that's a very, very important people to, thing to remember. I certainly remember that. I remember all four of my grandparents immigrated from Ukraine roughly 100 years ago. Uh, and I know for sure that if I happen to be born in Ukraine, I will be a lot poorer today. And so that movement, I think the movement of the, 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 the four Mancus, they weren't all Mancus, but you know, the four, the four, my four grandparents from Ukraine to the United States, the biggest impact of that event was on them and their descendants. And it was surely positive. And we, we, shouldn't, for, and we shouldn't forget that when we let, don't let people in, we're really dooming a lot of people to much less productive, much poorer, poorer lives. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have this evening. Please join me in one more time thanking Professor Mankiw. Thank you.